Hello, everyone, and welcome to this either last episode of 2021 or first episode of 2022, whenever I decide to actually premiere the thing. I haven't made up my mind yet. Probably the first or at around noon Eastern, so that's when you guys can look forward to that, just you know, for the sake of time, inconvenience, whatever. But, you know, just the formality is out of the way. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, more importantly, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> but <laughs> in all seriousness, I hope those of you who... Uh, like myself, used the Gregorian calendar, had a very nice Christmas, and, uh, you know, I, I hope those of you on the Julian calendar have a very nice Christmas next week. I Don't worry, we haven't forgotten about you, in, including <laughs> including yourself, but... That's right. That, I'm, I'm a Julian calendar boy, all the way. All the way, and you know what, perhaps, perhaps you might have a point, but that's aside the point. So, 2021 is come to an end, and it was a year of... I don't want to call it a year of happenings, but it was a year of ongoings. You know, you look at last year, yeah. 2020, that was a year of happenings. A lot of stuff happened. This was a year where a lot of stuff continued to happen, but very few new things happened. Now, there are some notable examples, which we'll dedicate the majority of the show to, don't get me wrong. But it's going to be kind of an odd episode, because we're going to have to constantly reference back to 2019, 2020, to give you the full context of what happened this year. As we've had to do for shows throughout this year. Now, this first topic may be very difficult for some of you. In fact, um, I've embraced my inner white woman. I have my wine ready. We're going to talk about the <laughs> day that fascism almost triumphed over our democracy, but don't worry, because uh, the, it's it's okay because Biden won in the end. And I'm, of course, yeah. referring to the uh, little incident on January 6th. Now... As the official narrative would have it, a bunch of insane fascists stormed into the Capitol building, trying to in install Trump as as dictator for life or, or something. But probably the biggest non-event of 2020, uh, 2021, they they sort of blend together, as I as I was alluding to earlier. But what you had was, of course, in the controversy of the 2020 election, the dispute over the results. Uh, Trump's final last-ditch effort was he was going to hold a big rally in D.C. and have a big protest so Congress would reconsider or, you know, actually audit these votes or whatever the hell the process was supposed to be. Maybe it was Trump's just uh, last act of grandiosity up until, I suppose, recently because the man can't stay out of the media spotlight for more than three months at a time. But with that being said, of course, it set the tone for this year and I think the decade to come at least of what it means to be a genuine right-winger or a genuine conservative, not one of these controlled opposition, quote-unquote classical liberals, or one of these people who sort of walks the middle of the road thing, what that generally means in America, where even the people, okay, let's just talk about the people who didn't enter into the Capitol, and the people who just protested in front of it, whatever, it's stuff that's been done for decades, if not centuries, uh, when it comes to this so-called liberal, liberal democracy. I mean, if it got exposed, they were even in the proximity of that event. Their lives are practically over socially. Maybe they can't do anything legally, but socially, it, it's a it's a death sentence. But it did show that if you are genuinely of any of these ideas in America, if you're further to the right of, say, a Mitt Romney, so to speak, or any of these figures, you are a social outcast, and you're possibly going to be subject to persecution by the legal system, as we saw with some of the treatment, some of the stuff that came out a few months ago, about the way that these 500 or so detainees have been treated since the incident back in January. And I suppose, looking at it objectively, taking a zoomed out view of it, it's not too surprising, but recognizing something in abstract, in theory, realizing, oh yeah, it sucks to be a right winger in America, uh, that we have literally no recourse... And actually seeing Penn put the paper in action being taken, it's worlds apart. Because, and I would say that's another theme this year. Whereas theoretically all these things I accept, all these things I realized, take on a whole new meaning when I actually watch them play out in real time. And that's probably the best summary I could give of this year. And certainly that theme will continue as we get into some of these other stories here. But really, you can't start off 2021 without starting off... You know, with uh, January 6th and, of course, the ascension of uh, the most popular president in American history, Joe Biden, and his wonderful tenure in office, which we'll have plenty to say over the course of this probably next hour and a half or so. So, 
I don't know. What do you think about January 6th? How horrible do you think it was? Do you have your comfort wine with you tonight? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I think the, what, what it did for the right wing is it, is it told them that um, they can contain these protests extremely well. There are already signs that they were doing that and that um, essentially it's no longer it's virtually no longer viable to use the tactics of the left or, you know, the Gramsci tactics of, uh, you know, uh, finding invasive ways to get into the institutions and win the back or doing this, you know, the same kind of street protests as the left has done, uh, th that it will achieve the same thing. And I think primarily why people believe that's possible is they believe in the foundations of liberalism. Liberalism promised that, you know, after, you know, the religious wars and the nationalist wars, it was really a, a mix of the two. It wasn't entirely one or the other, because you, you did have Protestant versus Protestant and Catholic versus Catholic uh, at various times, let's say from the 16th century onwards. Um, but liberalism. Yeah, even, even that, the infamous Thirty Years' War, there was um, inter-religious right. violence as opposed to intra-religious violence. Right, and and so uh, liberalism promised a objective third party that only um, uh, uh, supported a kind of basic morality that uh, both parties could agree on. And then commerce and daily civic life could go on as it always had done, which was an immense cope. But this cope set up an entire system and a, and a, and a, a value system and a belief in it that uh, has always hampered the right. And, you know, Basically, anyone who's in this, you know, in this liberal system has this, has her her own uh, values, and they're going to press down on the scale for their causes. And I think that um, the the right finally learned that it's not it's not possible. Now that I don't mean that um, you you know w one should never protest, but but essentially that they're generally ineffective and that there had better be a good cause. So I'm implying an, an exception here. So I think the protest that was had about a week after the Waukesha uh, hate crime that was committed, that's that's one of them. That's doable. Yeah, and even a lot of these anti-mandate, anti-lockdown protests also, uh, they are palatable enough to the public in order to not get the water cannon, so to speak. Whereas right, January 6th, which is something that is explicitly partisan, we're pro-Trump or Republican, we're whatever, got shut down because that's intolerable. Whereas Antifa, Black Lives Matter, etc., even though they are explicitly partisan movements, they have the favor of the state. If not an outright support, at least an act of tolerance. Right. I think... I mean, I think even January the 6th was a reaction to the o overwhelming impression in 2020 that uh, that all these uh, so-called um, impartial third parties within liberalism uh, were somehow neutral. I think that was destroyed in 2020. And I think, yes, uh, in the election or the election rigging was part of that. And the reaction wasn't, I think, merely just uh, to reinstate Trump. I think it's broader than that. Um, Trump certainly plays a role. Uh, if Trump had actually had an effect uh, there might have been even more protesters, like if he had had any, if he had actually achieved anything, which he did not, because he was effectively a president without power. So I think 2021 kind of cemented all the things that left mouths aghast, whether it was the riots, um, especially, I think, the riots and the election. 
I, I think 2021 confirmed this. But I think what also has happened is, I mean, you, you hear more people talk about the decline of American power. There are normies who talk about this now. But friends, you know, live friends of mine who are, are you know, between nine to 10 years older than I am, without me even bringing it up, you know, have said, yeah, America's probably gonna fracture. But the funny thing is, is I was saying this five years ago, right? And they all recall that. So what do I make of January the 6th? I, I spent enough of a, you know, um, establishing this preamble, but um, I mean, I think it was very frustrated people. Obviously it was a trap. Uh, we know that, you know, the, the Whitner uh, case is, uh, is proven to be a, a complete FBI setup. This has FBI agents within it and informants and so on. They certainly played a big role. It's harder to prove it, of course, because it's such a it's a much, much larger. Event. And not to mention the accounts of security on the grounds. Uh, a lot of people report were welcoming in the uh yeah unquote, i mean uh, the, the the cool plotters if you will <laughs> right so cnn and msnbc are very good at not showing you that right um so you know i think you know i don't i i don't i don't begrudge what what they did and i remember when it happened i was i was laughing i just thought it was one of the most amazing and hilarious things that was ever done. Um, this kind of F you to the system was incredible. And you can see that the system um, resented this. It's, they, they have to call it a coup attempt, even though we know there was no coup attempt. They, but they have to exaggerate its, its uh, lethality. They had to exaggerate uh, its agency. Right, and they have to exaggerate so much to the point where I will point out, based on personal anecdote, some of the more normie libs I know in my life, they thought it was the worst thing ever for like a week and a half, but then completely forgot about, it, never mentioned it after that. So even most shit libs did not care that this happened. You know, they they wrote it off, whatever. Especially after yeah. Biden got inaugurated, nobody cared. Literally right. nobody cared talking... except the media. It's a talking point. It's simply a talking point, like. You know the 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 steel dossier, Russia Gate. It's just a talking point. It's just a talking point for the mo to to win a current left right paradigm argument, and and even that, it's not it's not one that they readily think of using anymore. That said, I think I I think that you know um, America's elites really sincerely are afraid that there might be another one and the next one won't be the same. Um, I, I don't think it's a unanimous thing. I think some of them, uh, especially uh, when they revealed that the white population had shrunk down to 57%, it's actually, so things are accelerating faster than what we thought in 2017 when these topics uh, were uh, far more topical at the time. Um, and an another point I'll bring out about it being different in terms of the National Guard lockdown of D.C. for like several weeks after that, you'll notice it was the fat white women, the Hispanics, the whatever, and not like the yeah. Texas and Oklahoma National Guard, like these guys who've actually seen combat. You you'll 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 notice that very distinctly looking at those pictures that these are the weekend warriors, these are the desk jockeys of the National Guard that are put out there for the illusion of security and the illusion of so-called strength. Whereas, mm. uh, even though, again, I'm not predicting mutinies anytime soon, again, I think the jury's out on that. I think we're in a very odd situation. But I would say that a mutiny within a military organization, whether that be the military proper, National Guard, or whatever, would would catch me off guard. But with that yeah. being said is, you're much less likely to, even just when it comes down to physical condition, to get a revolt from the fat desk jockey than you are from the guy who's done, you know, a tour or two in Iraq or Afghanistan who just so happens to be part of, like, the Oklahoma National Guard. Yes, uh, that's a that's a very good point. Um, so, you know, I don't begrudge them what, what they did. Um, I've, I, I feel 
nothing but empathy for them, to be quite honest, right? Uh, you know, the, the government has had them in solitary confinement. Some of them will be now nearly a year in solitary confinement. Uh, you know, the, the, the war within America is still going on. This is part of that war. It is, um, it is being fought in ways that it wouldn't have been fought uh, exactly. But I, I think the takeaway for, for the right is uh, the understanding that there, that, that there is a system, uh, the complicity uh, within all the branches of government, uh, with the media, uh, it, you know, the list goes on. There are no objective third parties. You cannot rely on that. Uh, you can't say that America's never been more divided and at the same time argue that, well, at least there's some third party institutions that are not. Uh, these are very far and few between. Um, I mean, I mean, just examples. I don't mean the institutions overall. You know, Rittenhouse is an, is an exception, but that's only because there was enough film footage that you could not convict him. Man, you actually want to Had talk that about not like... been the case. He would be in prison forever. Oh, certainly. It, it, you know, considering the fact that cameras covering literally every angle is the only thing that really pulled his ass out of the fire. Like the judge did his job as a judge should in a quote unquote liberal democratic system. But again, people like him are old school. It's considered far right to be, uh, you know, to have like classical liberal principles when it comes to law and order and justice. So that's that's where we're at now. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of institutional power, to bring up something is. The mandates are also serving as a very effective uh, purging tool because, of, look, of course it's not a guarantee, but it heavily correlates whether you fall on one side of the issue or the other where you fall on other issues. You know, the anti-mandate people are admittedly more right-wing and even more of, say, our kind of right-wing, where, and mm -hmm. if they're going to stick their principles to the bitter end, they're going to be purged from any minor position of power they may have, which is why I think they've been so hard on pushing this in just the rank and file military and the rank and file national guard people to get the ones who are really the uh quote unquote true believers if you will to um you know to metaphorically or maybe in some cases literally uh you know die on the hill that they picked and we'll get more into that later in the episode but yeah you know i i will say my final thoughts on january 6th what i said when it first happened it was a very high risk low reward prospect and that it's not the downplay the way these people have been treated in captivity i think it's if there was ever such a thing as a quote unquote human right abuse we're witnessing it right now with that and again i i'm not like finger wagging at them but i'm just saying although 2020 exposed a lot of cracks in the system and a lot and you know caused people to lose a lot of faith in the system it also conversely I think with Antifa, with Black Lives Matter, going back to 2020, maybe people think like, hey, maybe if we cause a ruckus like that, we can get noticed. Where I, I think a lot of January 6th was still this big mindset on the right that the rules will be applied equally to us. So if we act rambunctious, if we yeah. act out like that, yes. maybe we'll get at least some concessions where... So I, I think that was also a wake-up call for a lot of people on the right that, hey, we're not going to get the same special privileges as, you know, the Chaz, if you will. Right, right. And then this is exactly this is exactly what I meant uh, when I said that, that the right basically, I think, has learned now uh, that the, the same rules do not apply. I, I mean, most of the right, I think, thought that when you look at the average attendant, uh, the person who attended, they were in their 40s and 50s. Uh, you know, th th these are basically Gen Xers in, in who in many ways are you know, completely unaware of where America is going. Yeah, as much as we clown on it, these are the people who genuinely believe QAnon was a real thing. Right, right. I mean, I think some of them for sure uh, in, in that crowd. Naturally, um, I exaggerate. But like, again, a I would say a non-insignificant part of that crowd, maybe not even close to majority, but a not insignificant part of that crowd would yeah. put some, if not a lot of stock into the so-called QAnon. Right, uh, for sure. And this goes back to, I mean, QAnon obviously was an American intelligence trap as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say that uh, Trump is also to blame because Trump led them on. Um, 
you, you know, I, I, I think he, I, I think he, he gave, he, he never outrightly said that, you know, I'm going to accept, um, you, you know, the outcome of this election. Um, of course, it's very difficult to because everybody saw at least five, six different cities with no exaggeration, over 130,000 ballots being rolled in. Yeah, on all, all these, all these blue at four, islands at four o'clock in the morning. All these blue islands and um, red seas like Detroit or Philadelphia, these places that again also voted for Trump, and these states that vote for Trump, all of a sudden these you know cities that are heavily Democratic, uh, mainly for demographic reasons, to be honest. All of a sudden, again, it turns out that there was a lot of civic participation among the uh, among the POC community, the BIPOC community, I think is uh, the new terminology for 2020, who really just swung that election last minute for them. And man, this is even touching all the way back in 2020. So you see, it the the two years kind of rolled together. It was like one long extended year, and we're probably yeah, going yeah. to get into like an even more extended year with uh with 2022. You know, a 2020 part three, if you will, or as I like to put it, a 2015 part seven is what I think we're really on, but that's aside the point. Um, but you know, with all with all that being said, as you were saying, it was a genuine cracks in legitimacy that led to this, and of course, Trump, whether he knew what he was doing or completely inadvertently, did lead them on, did make them think there was a fighting chance that hey, I can still win. Maybe it was for his ego. Maybe it was for I don't know some uh, like really conspiratorial backdoor deal that I made, who the hell knows at this point? It's, it's irrelevant. But point being is, a lot of good people, a lot of what I assume are good people, had their lives trashed by going in for this very high-risk, very low-reward prospect. And I do think, despite everything that came out of it, the right did learn some valuable lessons. That people yeah, I mean, he was he was a coward. He, he didn't even back them up after it happened. Oh, certainly, yeah. He was he was the first to throw him under the bus, and you know that's not even getting into his administration, which were even quicker to throw you know both Trump and them under the bus. Uh, as I, I believe it was Mike Pence that ordered the National Guard into the city on the day of it as acting president. So it, mm-hmm. it it just shows you where where things stand with that. But I suppose we should move on to the event directly related to January sixth, which is uh, the most popular president in American history, Joe Biden, was inaugurated on January twentieth, two thousand twenty one. <laughs> The man hasn't even been here for office, and somehow it feels like he's barely been seen, and he's also been there for a century. One of those sort of deals. And I think the name absentee president is still largely accurate. He's been making himself known more and more, but I do think because of his age, because of his um, alleged both physical and mental health problems that, yeah, they have to keep him pretty cloistered. They have to keep him behind closed doors when they absolutely don't need him, unless they need him to... You know, talk about like a you know a, a cold winter of death and destruction, or whatever the hell he was going on about a few days ago, or you know, any of these things. He's been a very uh, secluded president, which I think most people expect. I think that's kind of what the regime wanted, especially after about what two or three very open, boisterous media presidents, and even like four if you want to include Clinton, because. Both Obama and Trump were complete media whores. They loved the cameras. They loved being in the center of attention. Now, admittedly, in very mm-hmm, different mm-hmm. ways. Trump liked. Trump, I do believe, genuinely enjoyed being the antagonist of the media. He liked to, you know, have the press conference where he gets to break the journalist. Obama loved the fluff pieces. But point being is, they were both media whores. There's literally no other way to put it. So you have Biden, who really, I suppose he contrasts him to Bush, isn't that much different when it comes to media appearance. Now, Bush had a lot more public crises, say 9-11, Iraq War, Afghanistan War, to de- Katrina to deal with. Um, not that Biden's uh, presidency hasn't been full of uh, issues, but in terms of public media attention, it doesn't quite mount up to that scale. So it, it is comparable to some of the presidents we've had, even in living memory, but it's just that the past two have been such tension whores that it's it, it seems like a complete whiplash. Now, that's not me saying that Biden isn't being hidden away when you know, they absolutely don't have to show him, but the point being is, with Biden, it feels like he's both doing the worst job in the world, but also, conversely, no job, and I think we alluded to this even in some of our earlier episodes. He is simply a cog in the machine. He's simply something that holds things down, 
but the machine is functioning as intentioned, and it could continue if you replace it with any other sort of cog. And that a lot of the actions we're seeing right now aren't necessarily because of his direct decisions, and the ones that are because of his direct decisions, say the Afghanistan withdrawal, always become these big uh, uh, media circuses. But again, there's really no way to describe the man. I still maintain to my early description of him as the absentee president. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, his whole purpose was basically to be some kind of a placeholder or figurehead to get rid of Trump, essentially. That that was it. After four years of nonstop uh, attack on Trump by the media, um, you know, most dangerous president ever, like he really, and we've discussed this on the show, like he really cannot be remembered at all, like they will go, they will try everything to, to pretend he was never president. Um, it remains to be seen if uh, he will do something like George Bush Jr. when he, you know, when he said that the, you know, the January the six rioters were equal to the Taliban. And they were the greatest danger to America. Now, Trump is out saying, uh, you know, get the boost. So, you know, the worst thing that could happen is Trump gets reelected. Uh, I, I would hope he doesn't, uh, because that would just mean that, you know, the, the, the system has engineered him as well. Oh, I, I would certainly uh, agree. Trump has much more value as— I don't, I don't believe in his as, first term, though. Uh, Trump has much more value at this point as something of a political martyr than he does anything you can do in the office. Right, right. But— um, I, I think in, in some ways, Trump is, with, with his new rhetoric, he's diffusing that kind of polarity that the system itself needs, right? The system needs to tell you who the enemy is. And prior to 2021 or half, let's say up until the first half of 2021, Trump was, in a sense, still in office because, uh, you know, they just couldn't wash the, the memory of January the 6th and they... Or, or the or his four years in office and so on and it, you know everybody was deathly afraid that uh, he would continue to be this major influence there's there were countless CNN uh, segments where you know the, the Trump supporters Trump this Trump that uh, greatest danger to America and so on and so on so um, I, I, you know I, I would say that uh, If he runs, he's not he, he he's not going to win because I think, you know, the Biden presidency, if anything, is showing a kind of a morass within America's political system. And you mentioned about how much each of them was a, was a camera whore. I mean, they're part of the managerial world that you know took over after the first world, first and second world wars. And to do that, you have to be an actor. You have to convince the public that you're indispensable, right? Because again, the premise is that the institutions are neutral. Uh, even conservatives who claim the institutions are not neutral uh, believe that they can be made neutral once again. They don't even want, want their side to win. They don't even uh, accept the impossibility of a neutral objective position. Uh, in, in many ways, they've absorbed some of these uh, arguments from the Enlightenment, um, which, are, which were essentially was just, you know, to stop Europe from tearing itself apart. Not that it worked. Uh, um, so th they've, really, they've really absorbed them. And uh, this is why they lose. But to get back to Biden, you know, um, Biden is now literally uh, the most unpopular president since World War II, without question. Uh, he is definitely as unpopular as Jimmy Carter. Uh, I read a poll today, uh, make of that what you will, uh, that he is more unpopular than Kamala Harris. And Kamala Harris is actually more unpopular than um, Dick Cheney as far as vice presidents go. So, uh, you know, I think that they're very cognizant of what a bad year this has been. And now that Trump is not there, 
criticisms towards the Biden administration can be more direct. You can't keep making excuses. Uh, Trump, Trump is irrelevant at this point. And so are his uh, supporters. Uh, and besides, you're the president. You were going to heal the country. You were going to, uh, I presume, based on your language, uh, extend an olive branch of some kind or another. But I mean, of course, we didn't ever believe that. But um, yeah, and you were also supposed to, you know, bring us out of, you know, bring life back to normal out of the, you know, pandemic after a hundred days is what he was promising as well. That's right. That, that's a that's a very good point. Uh, I mean, we often forget very quickly, uh, you know, those sorts of promises. But oh, um, certainly, because in many ways, because COVID has completely dominated everybody's mind for two years now for two years well for one year but we will go into the second uh, year yeah like it's i yeah we're on the precipice of entering the third year of coverage you know the second anniversary which was like late february is when the mainstream society decided to acknowledge it march 2020 is when they decided to do something about it which was far too late for the sort of measures they were proposing which is something i maintained from the beginning i admit i was wrong about a lot of things going all the way back to early 2020 but I think maybe again, you know, a, a, a two weeks to flatten the curve, sort you know, the rhetoric they pull out that would have worked in January or February 2020. But by the time they did that kind of stuff, they had to accept that yeah, this has made its way into our society. It's something we're going to live with. It's something we're not going to have to find an effective treatment for. And we also saw how that turned out. But that's that's all aside the point. But getting back to Biden himself, as somebody who obviously didn't vote for him and obviously isn't a supporter, uh, one thing I will say is. Of course, the media never buys its own narrative, but a lot of people, I do think, have an extreme disappointment about Biden because he was billed as this political savior by the media. A lot of these people who just, you know, take what the media says hook, line, and sinker. So uh, there's there's that feeling of disappointment, that feeling of being betrayed, let down, so to speak, from, I think, a significant part of the uh, Democratic base. In fact, I, I know you can't use social media to judge it, but... There's the infamous Twitter account, one of my favorites, uh, Biden voters posting their L's, where it just goes through a <laughs> bunch of people who are like these partisan Democrats, whatever, who openly support Biden, whatever, will like complain about things that are a direct result of him. Uh, and, you know, again, don't even get me started about the gas prices. But in terms of Joe Biden himself, I can't even bring myself to really hate the man. Like it's, He's so far to bet the back of my mind because of what an ultimately irrelevant role he plays in all of this compared to what the regime is, what the system is, I can't even spare enough to even actively dislike or, or hate the man. I just sip that he's there. I, I Again, as somebody with no faith in the um, current system, as somebody with no faith in the regime, I think that, you know, it's honestly in its way to collapse or some sort of impending doom. Perhaps that makes it easier. It's perhaps being less invested makes that much easier, which I do think is why you get, funny enough, a lot more vitriol out of the left when it comes to people like Trump or people that they don't like in office, because they still have a stake in the system, whereas a lot of people on the right, not certainly not everyone, but a lot of people on the right, simply can't bring themselves to really care that much about Biden, because, uh, again, what he does is ultimately irrelevant compared to the regime that is already in place. And, you know, again, I suppose the big question going into the new year is... Uh, Will Biden's health, will his physical health, will his mental health be his undoing? Now, I, I believe it was leaked conversations between the American and Canadian governments, uh, American officials speaking with Trudeau, yep. saying that they highly expect that Kamala Harris will be president around or after late 2022, after the midterm elections. So, and uh, again, with the close just diplomatic relations America and Canada show, you know, have... It makes sense why, again, you know, the, the Canadian Prime Minister would be tipped off about that probably before about anyone else in the world, except maybe, let's be honest, the uh, the Israeli Prime Minister and the Israeli government might beat them to that punch. <laughs> but that's only because they yes. have so much influence in the government and so many, uh, you know, frankly, double agents. And, you know, it's not out of any, like, you know, genuine relationship. But with, right. with that aside, the point, um, I'm not I'm not definitively saying Biden will be out in 2022. But it wouldn't surprise me if we have to swear in a vice president this year. That's a that's a definite possibility. I, and I think, yes, it's safe to say that nothing will be done until after the primaries. Uh, 
it's possible that they do very badly that they may not even uh you know switch to kamala it but it again it, the the other poll here that can affect things is uh biden himself uh and and his mental health um you know, we've seen virtual White House rooms that were sets. Uh, it, it's very much part of neoliberalism, isn't it? Like neoliberalism has this quirky kind of nostalgia. Uh, America does too. That's why it has Disneyland, um, where it's completely phony. And, you know, whether it's the city's constantly being upturned so that there are no narrow streets preserved anywhere so there's no history preserved anywhere now there are exceptions of course but the vast majority of american cities are completely remade don't even get me started even and, the majority of american small towns like 15 20 000 people are like that as, uh, as well right so uh, you know it, 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 it's a simulacrum uh it's a, it, 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 it's there to simulate um some kind of normalcy that we've gotten used to. Um, of course, Biden's biggest blunder was Afghanistan. No question. No question. Uh, we went over that extensively. Uh, why he mismanaged the troops. Yeah, I mean, we, we were uh, doing a three month lead up before the withdrawal. Period. Like, three months. Like, I, I, I went back through our episodes. We were talking about this all yeah. the way back in May of 2020. That's right. That's right. We were we were way ahead of the curve on that. And the other thing that we were ahead of the curve was in late 2019 when we were saying um, the right no longer really has a stake in 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 America. Uh, now, there are people who are part of the, you know, who vote for the GOP and they have that that sickening feeling as well. Yeah, it's um... and. And I think in 2021, we saw that, as you mentioned just briefly, uh, that, the you know, the libs, the left definitely has far more to lose and far more at stake in perpetuating America than um, than the right does, which is why I think the Biden presidency is is so appalling. Right. Um, they don't talk about it because it is depressing. But there's another reason why they don't talk about it, and that is if you understand inner party, outer party, the outer power party, which are the, the Republicans, the conservatives, uh, particularly after World War II, they're always going to be the outer party. That's understood, uh, considering that World War II was a kind of revolution. So um, in that sense, when a Democrat is in power, unless there's one or two significant points of resistance, it's back to normalcy. And so there are more ho-hum about it because the outer party is not in. If the outer party wins, or if the outer party wins in a big way, and in a sense, that's what happened under Trump, it's basically telling the inner party, it's a barometer, of course, uh, that they're not doing their job very well. And that's why that's why it makes liberals on an unconscious level panicked, right? But I do believe that the inefficacy of his administration and the similar kind of schizophrenic policymaking that was in Trump's is also plaguing his own administration. And you can see that after they pull out of Afghanistan, Putin is already like, you know, in three months and less than three months, he's making ultimatums. He's making demands. He wants this in writing. Uh, do this or else. Biden agrees to have talks, um, which will be exclusively between him and Putin uh, beginning in the new year. Uh, yes, later the Europeans can um, can join in, but they're only going to be given their marching orders. You know, just uh, to Burrell touch on that. Um... And Stoltenberg lost their minds over this uh, the last few days. Oh yeah, Europe has been in a. Um, it's it's been interesting watching what what Europe has been doing. But in terms of Putin and making demands after the collapse of Afghanistan, and I'm sure there's other factors at play, but I do think it also shows a difference in ambition between Russia and China. Where I suppose China, beyond Taiwan, doesn't have more reason to make these demands, especially considering the fact that 
there hasn't been at least a latent conflict there, whereas with Russia and Ukraine and the Donbass and Crimea, there has been a bit of a latent conflict. There's been many latent yeah. conflicts with Russia that they can make demands on. But I would have assumed after Afghanistan fell that you would have seen a lot more ambition on China's part. Now, I'm not saying you haven't seen anything. They're one of the first people to really swoop in and want to make these deals with the new government in Afghanistan. Of course, again, Taiwan is... As much as people like to compare it, including ourselves, is a vastly different situation than Crimea. But I, I figured we would have seen more Chinese demands or China at least acting a bit more boisterous out of this. And perhaps that comes down to the personality between Putin and Xi Jinping, uh, just the way they conduct themselves on the world stage, the way they conduct themselves diplomatically. But not that I want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but I figured that was just an interesting thing to mention there. Yeah, and you can see also how uh, both Biden and uh, Boris are are you know flipping the script on on COVID mandates and on lockdowns, right? Oh, go ahead, have a great time. You know, there's no federal solution to this. It, it, it I mean, it is theater, but it is a necessary theater. And so, you know, I think they are very concerned that um, the outer party winning the primaries is going to be uh, an indication and an indictment of the inefficacy, right? And now they're going to see it as a kind of, um, you know, a polar kind of uh, uh, interpretation, meaning uh, this guy who questionably beat uh, Trump in the 2020 election, look at him, you know, he hasn't achieved anything. Uh, he's, he's made us an embarrassment. You know, the libs complained about Trump making us an embarrassment. Look at Biden, you know. Um, those are the kind of comparisons that they're going to make. Uh, and if if the Democrats lose the primaries, uh, that will surely, uh, be, you know, be, it'll be political fodder for sure uh, by, by the GOP. As well, they should. I mean, as long as, you know, they're going to make, keep this theater going. But um, yeah, so I don't, you know, uh, Biden's uh, first year has been abysmal. I would say it's worse than Trump's first year. Oh, certainly. And I, I don't think there's much disputing that. Now, getting on to some other stuff beyond domestic news, uh, I suppose Middle East is the next pla best place to go here. Um, I, I do think that uh, your friend over here, Mr. Constantine Martelli, uh, you checked on their channel owner, co-host GSP over here. He agrees with me on this, by the way, so let's give him the proper amount of credit. Last term of Idlib. Idlib will be done before, let's, I, I think it's June 21st, 2022. The Idlib will have fallen, either by military might or negotiation. I'm holding yep. to that steadfastly. And I think it's probably, if I had to make a bold prediction, uh, a spring offensive in Syria is probably within the cards right now, especially with the conduct of the American Empire and the general perceived American weakness over the past year, and I imagine that trend will continue. Unless Biden really flips the script, which I don't think he's in a position to, and especially not in a position to, you know, curry the favor of any European allies, such as a, you know, France, US, UK coalition, as we saw with the Trump strikes. Um, and if I had to make a bold prediction, once again, uh, the northwestern pocket of resistance in Syria controlled by whatever various groups, whether that be HTS, Al-Sham, however they're branding themselves at the time, as well as the Turkish-backed forces, will have capitulated or have been crushed militarily by spring 2022. I'm expecting a big spring offensive out of Syria. Maybe that will garner some sort of fake uh, so-called chemical attack. We'll see how that goes. But I don't see it surviving past that. And judging on just the past... You know, 10, at that point, will be 11 years of the Syrian war. That would be the move that I think everyone would predict. However, again, these past few years have a way of throwing wrenches into things, but I'm still holding steadfast to this one. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we don't know exactly what's going to transpire with the negotiations between Putin and Biden in, um, in January. I don't know how significant... Uh, Syria will be, but I would say, um, given the withdrawal from Afghanistan, given the integration into the Shanghai Cooperative Agreement, um, 
the lucrative loan and deal that's been worked out between Iran and China. Mind you, they're also building now a railroad that's going to go into nagorno karabakh then into Turkey. Another railroad will go through the stands into central Siberia. Um, so there's all kinds of things that are happening in Central Asia. And remember what Brzezinski said, you know, Brzezinski in the grand chessboard was not always that optimistic. And the way he looked at it, if, if, if America does not get a foothold and keep it in Central Asia, then by 2030, all of this will be reversed. That's why he was so adamant about invading Afghanistan because, you, you know, you have to understand the book was published four years before the invasion. So, you know, I mean, he was uh, a CIA advisor to Jimmy Carter um, way back when. Uh, so I, I think another proposal is for a railroad that will also link up Syria to the Mediterranean through Iraq into Iran. Um, Iran, in many ways, was supposed to be this country that was to be won over. And you can see that Obama was much more shrewd about achieving this goal that Brzezinski said would have to be accomplished in order to um, dominate Central Asia, and that is to make a friend with Iran. Um, but you can see that the source of America's schizophrenic geopolitics is based on its relationship with Israel and the many Israeli and Jewish lobbies within America. They have made that impossible and they have paved the way really for America losing its hegemony, particularly in the most important region of the globe. Because you know, getting a foothold in Afghanistan or Kazakhstan or one of the stands would have been good. But if you look at the three major doorways into Central Asia, the main one really is Iran. It's the one that's had historically the largest ongoing civilization. Kazakhstan and Siberia and Turkmenistan cannot claim the same thing. Western China is extremely harsh and sparsely populated. So, and of course, it has the Himalayas. And not to mention, so, Iran was a steadfast American ally up until the revolution in '79. So, and yes. while that may seem like a long time, just from the perspective of one person, in terms of geopolitics, in terms of the way world history goes, it's really a blip on the radar. It, it a brief spat between nations, if you will. Right, and, and they have lost Iran. Or, or, it's it's completely over. It's oh, over. Oh, absolutely. It's, and and Biden's it's, uh, it's it's over. Yeah, I I we we were saying this back in like late 2020 that we were uh, um even like the prospects of taking Iran militarily were, was was closed off, and yeah. Biden's um, attempts in vain to try to resuscitate the Iran deal, resuscitate the JCPOA in any capacity. I do think is just that, just a formality that. Iran has been lost from the Western sphere of influence. And you brought up Brzezinski, who I have still maintained for quite some time, is while, of course, I oppose everything he stands for, he was the really last great strategic mind the Western world had to offer, that the American Empire had to offer. And really the only one who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody like Putin, like, like uh, Lavrov. And mm -hmm. I suppose it's fitting that he died only a couple months after Trump came into office. Although, it would have been very interesting to watch him, again, because you you didn't make any bones about it, and he didn't make any bones about it in the Grand Chessboard. He certainly wasn't an optimist. He wasn't somebody who would have coped and said, don't worry, guys, we're actually winning. In fact, he was probably, I don't know, maybe it comes from the uh, Polish blood, and I'm likely to take the much more pessimistic view of things. And really, as again, as much as worldviews may be diametrically opposed between people like us and Brzezinski, I still think if we got a few more years out of him, he would have been one of the most insightful people to turn to. Right, right. I think that's a great point because he was making all kinds of statements and claims just a year, six months before he died. You know, like, who do you think is going to be necessary to govern 
of the Middle East, the entire, you have to think, the Atlantic Council crowd is there. This is the major think tank of NATO and America. And he says, China and Russia. He, the, the, the audience was, I wouldn't say they were flabbergasted, but they were speechless. So they, they I, when he said that, and hands immediately started to go up. So there was a kind of a panic that, 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 that set in. So yeah, he is, he, he was, even though he's on the opposite side, he, he was a realist. Yeah, I, I think it would have been very interesting just from the point of view of, you know, watching him tell our enemies the hard truth that, you know, and of course we can say it all day. They just discount us wholesale because our worldviews are diametrically opposed. But when one of their own says it, like that Atlantic Council conference, it's uh, it's not beyond the pale, but it's just this moment of shock that they really don't know how to respond when you know one of their own, one of the good guys says that. But really, even f- for almost five years after his death, still probably one of the most present people to turn to when it comes to analysis of the Middle East and Central Asia. And going back to the uh, Iran issue... Uh, yeah, that, that door has been closed, that has been securely locked down by China. And also, you, you did mention the conflict between the Zionist lobby and versus the more raw American empire, how those interests would clash time and time again in the Middle East. It, it is interesting, beyond the Israel-Palestine stuff, which we'll cover a little bit of, because we did dedicate a very in-depth episode to that this year, a few in-depth episodes to that this year. Beyond that dust-up, in the May of this year, it's been very quiet when it comes to the Zionist front. Now, of course, you had the government shakeup in Israel, but once again, it's in terms of what you think Zionist influence on America is, it's been almost radio silent. And that's mm-hmm. after, mm-hmm. maybe it's because of four years of Trump and the way he behaved. But even with uh, Netanyahu acquiescing to Biden and Biden acquiescing to not Netanyahu, et cetera, et cetera, and then Bennett's government coming into power, while I'm not saying by any means that relationship has been broken, it's become something much less noteworthy. It's become something that's been relegated much more to the background, at least in so far as the public eye is concerned. Now, again, I, a lot is continuing on as business as usual, don't get me wrong, but what else we can say here is that it doesn't take the front and center stage it has for about the past, what, 20 years, I would say, since 9-11? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, one more thing I'll say about Brzezinski is I think I think a lot of things he said were out of frustration that he wasn't being listened to. I think he had a concept that, um, you know, um, America, and he did mean like a, a liberal democracy America, was worth more than Israel and worth more to Israel uh, in the long run. That um, basically uh, helping to bring down America inadvertently or inadvertently um, w- would be would be bad for Israel. But, um, you know, there's so much pride there. Uh, so, I, you know, I remember shortly after uh, Crimea voted to secede from Ukraine, he was on Bloomberg and the guy that was interviewing him was, you know, uh, he was very vocal. Uh, he, he was, you know, calling typically Putin as a thug, like, okay, he's a thug. And, and, and it would exacerbate the, the guest. And, and he says, well, I mean, and he goes, yeah, but that's not going to do anything. So I think I think he felt like um, you guys screwed up on Iran and now it's too late. I think maybe that's what was going on in his mind at that time. Now, sort of this extreme vindication on his um, end saying I was right. I, 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 I think all. he became even, even more pessimistic. It's... Yeah. Yeah, I think so. By I the way, I wonder who that sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> but as you as you were saying, hello. 
yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Don't worry. Uh, no, no, I, that's yeah. that, that's uh, that, that's all I have to to add. And would it be a war report year in review without one technical difficulty? I, I suppose here we are. But uh, moving on, moving on from that point right there, we do have, of course, the news out of Europe and Russia. Now, it's been a uh, quite the year when it comes to the way Europe has conducted itself, the Russian and Ukraine conflict, and even by extension Turkey. And I say it's easiest to start with Europe because less happened there. It wasn't really a big year in terms of elections outside of Germany, in which case we did see the departure of Angela Merkel, uh, or uh, uh, according to some liberals, the most qualified person to deal with Putin, who oversaw the completion of Nord Stream 2 even to this day, and uh, the, the complete and final touches on Nord Stream 2. It's, it's almost amazing how that panned out. A special kind of irony with that. <laughs> um, Macron really calmed down this year as opposed to 2019, 2020. He wasn't really the sort of Jupiterian character that he was in the past couple years. It's not to say he didn't do anything, but I don't know, maybe he's trying to calm down before the elections in 2022, the elections coming up this, uh, this spring, but I expected more out of him this year, if I'm being honest. I expected him to be more boisterous, and maybe just so many of his efforts just simply didn't pan out that he decided to lay low for a while. And I think that's certainly a possibility, certainly something worth considering when it comes to that. Uh, the UK has been probably one of the worst countries in the world, up there with Australia and New Zealand, when it comes to the lockdown madness that's become sort of Boris Johnson's legacy. And as we were saying earlier, he's worked very hard to try to backtrack that and say, go out and enjoy your holiday, there's nothing to worry about there, we're beyond a federal solution, even though that's more Biden's words, but we're beyond a cohesive national government solution. So uh, that's that's the news out, out of the UK, but um, I suppose with that being said, Russia and Ukraine, now in mm-hmm. the post-Afghanistan era, that has really become the flashpoint that the American media loves to focus on, the new geopolitical hotspot. And as we were saying, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail, more detail. Uh, uh, we can't really go more in detail than we have just this past year, but we'll give you a proper recap in just a minute here. But Ukraine has become the epicenter of geopolitical controversy with Russia making these concessions, with Ukraine fearing this uh, impending invasion for the past several months uh, in regard to the Afghanistan issue. Now, this started all the way back in March and April, where uh, there were water dispute issues, what the official story was, with Russian troops massing the border. That fizzled out. Then we went into this most recent one that started to pick up around October through present day, where you've had this Russian buildup, you've had just all these internal crises in Ukraine lead up, lead us up to the moment we are now. Of course, Zelensky is not popular right now. He's not close to an election year. That's not until, I believe, either 2023 or 24, but mm-hmm. point being is... I think it's one year before Biden. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a five-year term they do in Ukraine. But mm-hmm. yeah, so that, that'll be interesting. But his popularity is certainly faltering, which is fitting of a Ukrainian president. Seldom do they last more than two terms. I think, in fact, the only Ukrainian president to be reelected was Yanukovych, who was swiftly removed from power. Just about that was by a good coup. <laughs> yeah, that. But yeah, don't worry. The Maidan. That was a good insurrection. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They were the good guys storming the Capitol building in Kiev and storming police stations and snipers on the roof. That is justified in the name of liberal democracy and global homogenization. So, like, it's not like these far right, it's not like these neo-Nazis or whatever they want to call them. Funny enough, you have noticed the trend over the past two, three years of them to start to throw these more far right Ukrainian groups under the bus. These people who have actually been doing the legwork of the fighting, the people who are, you know, volunteering for either the Ukrainian military proper or one of these various militant groups to actually go fight the separatists. Uh, they've been given the runaround lately. And I suppose the main product, the main progenitor of the Ukrainian conflict, you could say, at this point, is I think is Zelensky's incompetence and his desire to gain some political popularity, so of course he does this thing where he wants to stand up to Russia, wants to stand up to the Donbass, but of course he and Ukraine are not in a position to do that, 
with very tepid support from the West. Of course, you'll have Biden get out there and make statements, or you'll have whoever get. Uh, Blinken is actually more likely to come out there and make those statements. Various European powers, whether that be, um, you know, Stoltenberg or, uh, well, what, what's 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 the one guy? I, I always forget his name. The European Union's foreign minister. Uh, you, you were just talking about it. Oh, Burrell. Yeah, Burrell gets out there. Joseph Burrell, yeah. Uh, that, you know, that puke. Uh, you know, but uh, this, this, this cavalcade of characters gets out there. And you could even apply this to the most recent Belarus crisis. There are the ongoing Belarus crisis, I should say. And they get out there, they talk this big game, they talk about standing up to Russia and liberating Ukraine and or Belarus, depending on whatever context they're talking about. And then it ultimately amounts to nothing... Rush seems to gain more and more concessions, and cries of invasion continue. And it, it really seems to be this fear-mongering of a Russian invasion is the wrong narrative for the Western media to pick up when you consider from the perspective of the American Empire. Perhaps they want this. So you want to turn Russia into this uh, into this eminent threat of the European continent. Uh, they're they're bullying the Ukraine. They're trying to integrate with Belarus. Whatever. And this is also coupled with the past few years since about 2018, calls for a U- European army or a more independent European foreign policy. So you couple those two things. I don't know, maybe America's finally wanting to hand off the baton across the Atlantic, saying Europe needs to manage more of its own affairs for the time being. And with this new German administration, perhaps they have just the candidates to do that. But again, even just for practical reasons, it's not like Germany is in a position to uh, become a great crusader against Russia. Maybe it is as it was in the days of old. Maybe as it was, uh, <laughs> you know, back in the back in the 15th century, or what was that the 13th century? P- point being, several <laughs> several centuries ago. My my exact history dates are a bit foggy right now. It's been a long day. But with that being said, is it's really as much as they want to fearmonger about this. There's no narrative victory for the West in this one. And there's also yeah. no tangible victory. I suppose just a formality at this point that they have to, uh, you know, lay down the line against Russia, even though they're not going to do anything to enforce said red line. And really, I, I suppose that's the story of the past, what, seven, eight years at this point? It's been about eight years since the Maidan mm-hmm. and almost eight years since the annexations of Crimea and the start of the wars in eastern Ukraine. And that's been an ongoing trend. I think that trend is very evident in the post-Afghanistan era, as I was saying. But at this point, I don't even know what ulterior motive they have for continuing with the straight. Is it just to save face? Is it just not to look like... Is it just not to have a second sort of Afghanistan withdrawal situation on their hands where they just get a bunch of egg on their face? That's the only logical conclusion I can come to. That's the only thing that makes sense. I, I agree. I think short term that is uh, that is the case. But I think when you when you try to consider what are America's options, I, you know the, the number one option that I I kind of see going forward is consolidate the power. And we've spoken about this before. This is why after January the sixth, they had to uh, make sure that there were no right wing. Um, uh, fanatics within the uh, American military, and then they use COVID uh, basically as a cudgel to achieve more or less the same thing. Um, uh, you know, and we've the 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 wokening of the American military, of course, has been going on for quite some time, but it's really stepped up the last decade. Um, that that said, um, that's a form of consolidation, uh, bringing Europe to toe. Yeah, and is it, another one. Wasn't there also that Bloomberg article of a couple of days ago saying America's best export is wokeness? Yeah, 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 yeah. like it, it's their soft power. Like um, American wokeness today is what um, you know democracy was back in the you know from the fifties to the eighties. Like <laughs> that's it. That that's a, a soft power. Uh, you know, projection. Look, all I'm saying is on the war report, we're over here living in Vindication Nation. We've been saying all these things since 2018, 2019. You guys just had to listen. Yeah. And you know what? The people here, they have listened. But to the general public, you have not listened. <laughs> and and another, another story in that vein was in, in late winter this year, I think it was late February, 
when Biden had the strikes on the Iranian militant groups in Syria, a lot of people were talking about woke imperialism, liberal imperialism. It's like we've been saying this since 2018. Uh, th- uh, pe- uh, yeah. People are yeah. acting like this uh, novel new concept they discovered when, I'm not saying it's just us, but people in these circles have said that, you know, yeah, the arm of the American empire is liberal ideology. It is what a lot of people call woke ideology, which I don't think is nearly vitriolic enough term for what it really is. But, you know, it's common parlance, so I'll capitulate on that point. Right. Um, you know, and we're, we're seeing this kind of consolidation and retraction. Uh, we saw it in Afghanistan, and that's the most visible way. But, uh, you know, just today, uh, there was a U.S. base in Syria that was being attacked with mortars. Um, uh, three convoys in the last two weeks have been turned back. Um, and these are just like villagers uh, that, are, that are doing this. Um, so m- my projection is... America needs a Cold War. They need a Cold War right now. They need unity with Europe and the Anglosphere. Several, you know, uh, AUKUS was developed this year, of course. So um, there is a kind of strengthening of this alignment. Um, You know, the Quad or whatever, I mean, that's a joke because, uh, you know, Putin regularly deals with India and in many ways he is the go-between when things are rough between India and China. And in fact, when they had the democracy summit, uh, the next day he was, you know, he was talking with Modi in India. So it's, uh, I, I don't, I don't take the quad thing seriously. And I think that's why there is an AUKUS and uh, because that would never happen uh, in, in with, with AUKUS. So uh, I would say they need a they need a new cold war. They need uh, they need that to buy time in order to strategize against China, because, you know, you were saying, um, wow, you think you know wokeism in the uh, in the in the military is just happening? Well, in in many ways, you can see that in in the elite media, um, similar things. That article was suggesting it it, it was implying. That you know, we should export wokeism to to the rest of the world. It would do them good, like as if you haven't been doing that for like since World War II. Like, what are you talking about, right? So, in in many ways, I mean, I would say elites are well aware of it, but they couch it that way, they frame it that way. That uh, like when they're about to uh, strengthen something, they make it sound like it's something that they're going to just start doing that they haven't done before. That's what I think is um, is funny. But yes, um, I, I think America doesn't really, like w- w- what else is, does America have? Capitulation? I mean, if Biden, and I don't, I don't foresee it, but if Biden actually agrees to sign something that's legally binding with, with Putin, sometime in 2022, because these talks are just prelim- preliminaries, right? There's nothing legally binding there. But he, if he does that symbolically, that will comple- it will shatter the entire perception of America. It really will. Yeah, like, and, and it, it, it has tears, of course, like if we're talking about like any official treaty or any reset being reached, and these aren't just uh, fruitless talks. Probably, and this is the most lofty, I do not expect this, I'm outright saying that, yeah, there's probably no possibility of this, is recognition of Crimea as Russia. That's not going to happen. That's been the justification for sanctions for the past seven years. Primarily, of course, that's extended out to election meddling or whatever else. And then, I suppose the next step you could take down is a de facto recognition, and I suppose we already reached that point just because of practicality, of Crimea and the Donbass as not Ukrainian. And then, again, working down probably Syria somewhere in that hierarchy, and the bottom of that hierarchy is nothing comes out of this. But point being is, the Russians, Putin, have found themselves in a negotiating position where there's really nothing to lose. They really can't go wrong here. There's very little they could do to come out looking like the weaker or the less competent party out of this. Whereas Biden, the situation must be very desperate, or his administration must be very arrogant, to go into this thinking that, we can come out on equal footing or looking strong on this because in my interpretation and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you have a different point of view, whatever. There is no way that 
the Biden administration, the American empire, doesn't come out, once again, getting egg on its face. And worst case scenario, Afghanistan withdrawal 2.0, or best case scenario is, again, nothing comes of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a few weeks ago, Putin addressed his generals and, and said, you know, at this point in time, we have to apply relentless pressure on on America. And that's what he's doing. And if you're his generals right now, you're seeing that you're saying this is paying off. This is paying off because they literally got America to admit in front of the world that if if Russia invades, America is not going to respond militarily to to help Ukraine. Right. So the point is to the government is already the you know, the, the country has already displayed a kind of uh, weakness. It's, it, it's been going on for quite some time. It's heightened uh, under the Biden administration in 2021. I mean, that, that really is, you know, that really is a kind of an Overton window that that uh, that we've had here. Like I say, I have normally lived friends that I, I actually have to tone some of this rhetoric down, of course. And, uh, and they're saying things that I, I was saying. And they're they're literally saying, you know, you were right about that, <laughs> right? So they know it's bad. They know it's bad. Um, yes, I, I, uh, that that's the only out for America right now is to they need they need an iron curtain. Yeah, they they need an other. They need something to define themselves against. Which I suppose you could say of every great empire and great civilization, but. For example, not to sing the praise of Russia and China too much is they have a much more solidified history, a much more solidified, let's just say, ethnos than America does. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have that, but it's been something that's been sidelined and subjugated for the past 60 years at least, if not the past century. And again, America has worked to define itself, especially in the post-World War II era, as its identity is lack thereof. Uh, there's... Uh, the only thing about being an American is accepting this, these these and these values, but not even that, or you know, these these and these values make you un-American, but not even that. It's it's a country that exists in the abstract, and while again there are ethnic Americans, while there are foundational Americans, it and even they're starting to realize I, from from my um, gatherings, from speaking to them, whatever, that they've been dispossessed from the nation built by their ancestors that. This is a strange puppeted corpse at best. Now, mm -hmm. now getting beyond that, point being is, so it is necessary in the current American regime, and let's just call it, you know, 20th century America, the GAE, um, the American Empire, um, you know, Global Homo, whatever of the millions of different names we could give this thing. It necessarily relies on defining itself against another. Of course, the genesis of that was World War II against the fascists and the Nazis and the Japanese. We need to stand up and fight freedom. Then we were the bulwark against communism throughout the Cold War. Then we were the defender of a peace and security in the face of terrorism. Even that is dissipated. And now, we're again, we're trying to define ourselves as a defender of peace and liberty in the face of what a, a Chinese threat. They're really trying to narratively make this... Cold War with China happening, and again, I'm not saying that America and China have great relations, but it's a bit of a one-sided Cold War because China just continue on business as usual, whereas America is right. taking this very and, confrontational and, policy. And think how many times China has has like purchased more American debt to keep America going. Yeah, and, and even so far as like a, a second Cold War with Russia, this is the country that again we're breaking down having negotiations from the countries that. For the past two, three years, we have been importing more and more oil from despite sanctions, despite whatever restrictions we have in place. And the country that Biden extended an olive branch to in order to counter China at the beginning of this year. So there's mm -hmm. not, I, there's functionally less of a Cold War with Russia than there is China, which is something I thought I would never see. But here we are. And again, you can't have a one side Cold War. At that point, it's just aimless belligerence, and you look like a fool in front of the rest of the world. Like, Again, I'm sure there are genuine diplomatic disputes that we have with China. There are genuine, you know, genuine reasons to consider China an adversary. But once again, a Cold War has to be two-sided, and it has to be playing up on much higher stakes. America and the Soviet Union, you know, the Cold War, 
those were two empires fighting for domination of the world under a, a thin veil of ideology, not that ideology was unimportant, but again, using the banner of ideology to pretty much uh, make the world submit to either Washington or Moscow. And uh, it was to the detriment of, I say both, frankly, much more the uh, Soviet Union. It's, it's interesting because you look at what some of the political candidates for the 1990s Russia Communist Party said, I think it was Zhuignov himself saying that, well, yeah, okay, we're ideologically communist, but that's no reason to support whatever guerrilla movement in Latin America rather than focus on the the, the, the Eurasian sphere of the Russian world or whatever. Point being is, uh, and I think that's a very valuable lesson that Russia has learned in these past 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union. By the way, uh, this past weekend, uh, the 25th and the 26th, which, of course, you know, Gregorian Christmas once again, uh, that, like, December 25th, 1991 was the last day of existence of the Soviet Union before it officially dissolved. So it's been mm -hmm. 30 years since the end of the Soviet Union. And just looking at Russia's conduct today, especially in this most recent Ukrainian crisis, I think one can definitively say that Russia has learned a lot from the collapse of the Soviet Union. Has America learned a lot from its historical experiences? Has America learned a lot from the Cold War? Has America learned a lot from even, you know, the great mythology of World War II? I don't really think you can say that. Right. And that, and partly because it's been so focused on, on you know, a, a kind of total hegemon, full spectrum dominance, as, it, as it's often referred to. Um, you know, one of the things that's uh, that, that was most, most interesting um, to this uh, that uh, academic agents said, you know, that he was he was basically talking about Stalin and he was talking about how. Um, essentially, Stalin was a conservative force within the Soviet Union. Uh, he outlined, he outlined just, you know, gays, uh, abortion, uh, you know, bolstered marriage, made divorce more difficult, uh, gave the church slightly more freedom. And you would think that American conservatives would understand uh, what was going on. But because they're so married themselves to the liberal notion of, uh, you know, the neutral uh, third party, the arbiter of peace, as it were. So in many ways, they don't even think that their own values are should dominate. Right. Um, and uh, we've discussed in this show before, uh, I think it was in 2020 when I, you know, I spoke about the Prague 11. You know, these were the 11. Jews in, in Prague that were part of the Communist Party that Stalin had executed. And yeah, the, the, uh, the Slansky is, trials, if you want to look more into that, by its that's right. official name. That's right. So one of the fascinating things that, that, that because, uh, you know, we, we were, we, we've spoken about this before. And, you know, uh, if anybody on the show who, you know, who, who listens to the show has read Yaki, you'll, you, he wrote about this, so you'll, un, you'll understand. Um, but essentially, it was a conservative force, like it was in many ways communist in, in a centralized economy and in its sort of, it, let's say, authoritarian measures. And it, it's not, interesting because a lot of died in the wool communists will decry Stalin for the exact same reasons that you're giving him some credit right now. Exactly right. That's why he's hated by by the left. Um, so things that. Um, one of the things that, that that the conservatives always miss is, is is this, right? Finding the right ally. And that is also why they are so focused against China. It's a total distraction, and it's just going to mean they lose. Um, you know, they accuse Biden of being soft on China, but China but Biden has been as hard on China, if not more, than Trump was. Um, and it's one after the other. Uh, another thing to consider. Uh, this this too was mentioned. On, uh, I just personally I love academic academic agent. I think the streams are literally the best streams happening right now. Period. And he said, when did because uh, America through the twenties and thirties was saying that you know the Soviet Union was a democracy and um, you know an ally, an important ally for democracy. W well, when did they stop saying that? W what took place? Well. Some of the things that their spies had noted was that 
by the time the 30s rolled around, it had been a circulation of elites within Russia. Uh, the other is that certain, virtually every Trotskyite either fled or was liquidated. Most of all, Trotsky himself. So when did they when did they decide that Russia was big and bad? Well, in a sense, they already decided before the end of World War II, but uh, they had to win a war, so they needed them. But soon after the war was over, you know, they they were no longer uh, an important um, ally of democracy in the world. Now, they always knew they were never a democracy. That's not the point, right? So when the reporters came back, you know, faking like you didn't know is is a ridiculous argument. Um, so the conservatives would have been better off if they had reached out to Stalin's Russia and Russia, you know, Soviet Russia. They, they I, I believe they would have. And you do, because you do get an interesting focus... thing with that, though, where throughout the 50s and into the 60s, the less hawkish voices in the American government, again, the Cold War was something that was very perpetuated and spearheaded by Democrats, whether that be, of course, Truman at that point into it, Whereas, uh, and it's funny because a lot of Russians and a lot of Russian analysts will even say this on the Russian side, that is, that they would always prefer the Republican presence because they were much more amenable and much more likely to negotiate. Whereas the Democrats, again, speaking in purely partisan terms, were the ones who wanted to escalate the Cold War, for example. Nixon had detente. Jimmy Carter, again, was the one who uh, tore up pretty much every agreement over Afghanistan. Uh, Eisenhower didn't intervene in Hungary, etc. And again, that's just getting into the partisan side. Just to, and getting at what you were saying is, uh, there is, and f we were discussing this last night, there's this propensity on the right, which I, I'm going to steal your bridge right here, to seek a foreign enemy when fundamentally they know they yes. are the second class citizens in their, em in their own empire where they want to mm -hmm. seek out the aggression of the Soviet Union or China and put a stop to that, whatever, while all of their values and everything they believe in is being undermined by the people in Washington, even by their so-called allies in Washington. And it, it's it's almost this, I suppose, it's sort of a cope, it's sort of a uh, catharsis on the right that we can ex appear as the strong empire abroad at the expense of having no influence at home. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So some of the age-old competition with Russia between the Anglos resurfaces, you know, you could say that. But it, I think during the Cold War, that was a different thing. I think, I think Stalin basically, like what I think America wanted or what most of the elites in America wanted after the Soviet Union was institutionalized uh, after the Civil War in Russia was that it would eventually become a Trotskyist nation, right? It would completely tap into international banking. There would be all kinds of companies that would, uh, would on the low, you know, in the books would actually be the owners of various industries, uh, that it could be a way to check on fascism within Europe, so on and so on and so on. And that isn't really what happened. And especially and the pivotal moment was when Stalin came to power, but particularly Stalin in the mid 30s. And, uh, you know, initially the Frankfurt School sought haven in Russia. And Stalin said, look, Stalin basically said, if you come here, I will kill you. <laughs> St Stalin hated the Frankfurt School. He, he, he literally called Trotsky a liberal, right? He despised them. So, I think once the Americans realized that the Trotskyist uh, branch lost power in Russia, Russia essentially had gone rogue. Yeah, and, and it just, was, it's just the further um, analysis. Look, if there had been no World War II, the Cold War would have started in the late 30s. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and you could argue that there were even some elements in the West that were hedging with Germany, with Italy, etc., these various powers against 
Russia against Stalin's Russia, viewing that as arguably more of a threat. Now, again, it's funny because you also got that from the uh, further right elements who wanted to destroy the Bolshevik state, um, or what they perceived as the Bolshevik state at this time. But uh, just in just the final book, and I'll put in Stalin, just a bit of a tangent. It is funny because you have Lenin, who's the son of a lawyer, Trotsky, who's this lifelong intellectual, this guy who spent half his life in a university, and all these people leading the Bolshevik Revolution initially are these sort of people, that, you know, the same kind of people we mock for being communists today. Whereas Stalin is the son of a cobbler who dropped out of a seminary. Like, again, like, okay, I suppose in the Russian Empire, you know, clergy had its prestige, but again, you didn't have the wealth and luxury of, say, what, you know, say, I mean, Lenin came from a very, forgive the use of the term, privileged background, but point being is the sort of people that these very ideological communists advocate for, you know, empowering, at least in rhetoric, when they are actually empowered, and I do think this is a effect of the communist psyche ever since in both the West and elsewhere, that, oh yeah, when we put the quote-unquote working class in power, they liquidate us. Yeah, yeah, so uh, people, I think, often, uh, they often forget, right, that the lead-up, the organization that would eventually become the CIA, the, the, the three big important figures from the Frankfurt School who made that a possibility and developed it were Theodore Adorno, Eric Fromm, and Herbert Marcuse, right? Like, that's not debatable, right? So, in, you know, the, the, you people have to understand that when they see Besmanov videos, what you're really looking at is a guy pandering to normie cons. That's what he's doing. Like all those people think that Russia is like shipping, uh, you know, Boris Badenov uh, characters into Russia to weaken the U.S. Right. The the fact is is those strains of liberalism already existed in America. And that is why the Frankfurt School found like literally fertile ground in America in a way that it could not find anywhere else in the world. Nowhere else but in America could they have prospered the way they did. And that, those those are just the facts. And it's the CIA is not something different after their passing. It's a blossoming of what they established. And I'm just curious, just it's a very irrelevant aside, but you have to say shame and curiosity here. But Eric- right, right wingers won't see it. So you know what they'll basically do is is they'll probably as as pressure mounts on China. What's that? Sorry, your voice was jumbled up on my end. Oh oh no no problem. But you you have to satiate my curiosity and answer me this. Is Eric Frum an ascendant of David Frum? Uh, no, you're, 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 I'm sorry. Your voice is like going like hyper fast and very garbled up. Uh, okay, don't worry about it then. Uh, welcome back to the technical difficulties report, but uh, do continue. Yeah, so uh, I just I just think that you know um, did they catch basically what I what I was just saying about uh, the Frankfurt School and uh, yes, yes how they basically helped establish yeah okay so yes um, you know that that is the CIA is a legacy of that moment in history right Stalin did not send them over <laughs> you, you know America wanted them there uh, and it's. Uh, because uh, essentially those men are liberals. They're a different kind of liberal, but they're, I, I guess, a radical, you know, social democrat liberal for their time. I mean, Theodore Adorno hated jazz. Um, he, there were a lot of things about black culture he didn't like. So they, you know, they they are products of their time as well. But, um, you know, make no mistake, right? What they want is to create um, an order that is, in their eyes, anti-authoritarian. But what it is, is an order that is um, essentially controlled by corporations, right? And um, that have no boundaries. There's no national boundaries. And uh, that's, that's, that's the purpose of the American military, is to establish that. 
And speaking of the American military, the last thing I wanted to cover, the uh, cherry on top of 2021, would be Afghanistan. And Mm -hmm. we dedicate, as we were saying about three months this, we also dedicate quite a bit of the show earlier to Afghanistan, but I think it's worth, once again, addressing. So it was by August 15th that the American withdrawal had been more or less completed with um, what officially we could get out there. Now, of course, there was still the question of how do we get these uh, left pine diplomats or these left pine quote unquote collaborators who worked with us in order, you know, even the dogs, which I think the dogs should have gotten precedent over both the diplomats and the uh, collaborators, but that's just me personally. Uh, <laughs> but with that being said, again, probably the biggest blemish on the American empire since GI, since Vietnam at least. And I would say in terms of, of course, human life lost in terms of scale of the war, Vietnam was much larger. But in terms of what it implied for the American Empire, it is, without question, Afghanistan was the worst blow of the American Empire. And it couldn't come at a worse time with the instability of the Trump era, with Biden being the quote-unquote most popular president in history, which we all know what that means. Um, yeah, uh, gee. Hey, remember when uh, the whole Brandon meme was the thing? I think it still kind of is. I, I think, I think boomers People still do it. Yeah, I... You know, I, I have to say, out of all the, like, quote-unquote mainstream memes, it's one of the ones that I can actually have a little bit of appreciation for. I think it has some sticking power, but we did an entire episode on that, or an entire part of an episode on that a few months back. But the point being is, it, it couldn't have come at a worse time. It was really the, um, I suppose from our point of view, the perfect storm, but also one of those things that, you know, we were anticipating for a while. We said, something's got to give sooner or later. But really, it is touching back on what I was saying at the beginning of the episode, thinking it'll happen in the abstract and watching it play out are completely different things. Now, I still maintain to this day that there was no clean way out of Afghanistan. Now, it was much dirtier than it needed to be. It was much more garbled than it needed to be. But there was no clean withdrawal from Afghanistan in the cards from the beginning. Mm-hmm. I mean, it could have it could have gone better. I, th- I think it was the worst planned evacuation, particularly when when it was more obvious that they would uh, lose uh, rapidly, uh, Biden decided to take the troops out and then decides to put them back in. It was stupid. Um, but yet, you know, here we are. Um, but I, I agree with you that, I mean, again, I, I, I bring it up, you know, the, the Russians literally just walked out without an incident. Um, on top of the regime they established lasting for about a year and a half, two years after the withdrawal. Yeah. two 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 point two or 2.3 years. It still lasted over two years. Yeah. Um, any, anyhow, I mean, um, I, I I think it was a signal. You saw the way uh, that Britain reacted. Britain was horrified. I I did not expect the MPs uh, to to be so vocal uh, against pulling out. But I think in many ways they are the barometer about where Europe is probably headed. Um, maybe because in some ways they're one of those countries that are most capable of you know withstanding the 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 future against a very different multipolar europe uh than say i don't know estonia or romania or slovakia right yeah. or let alone albania right um that said uh, th- you know england of course is is still in europe despite it being out of the EU. And I, I think, it, you know, I mean, let's face it, it was an empire for, for centuries. Uh, it's always had highly intelligent people. And I think their reaction in many ways gave, gave away the game about where things were going to go. It, um, they tried to disguise it that, it, no, it's not the pulling out, it's the way the pulling out happened, but it, that's not the case. Uh, th- there were a few that more or less admitted that they should there should never have been a pullout that this made afghanistan completely a waste of time that all everyone who died for afghanistan died for nothing um but i think of, of course the subtext is 
if you if you pull out, you're going you're essentially saying you've lost dominance. And the world is going to know it. And that is what has happened. Oh, absolutely. And with all of that, there's really not much more you can say about Afghanistan than we've already said, but it was just so in I would put it hands down, at least in the kind of stuff that we cover, the most important event of this year was the fall absolutely. of Afghanistan and uh, yeah. the implications that had for the American Empire. It's what the entire rest of the year really pivots around when you look at what happened after that with Ukraine, what happened in the build-up to that, even all the way back in April, May of 2021. There is really inescapable that this was the pivotal moment here. And I think that's going to be something that is going to be several years, if not a decade or two, before people actually are willing to discuss freely and openly and realize it's going to be one of those things that is more or less memory hold. You already see the way it's happening. Now the media couldn't get enough for it, of it for however long it was. And then it just dropped off the radar after, after about, it was either the 12 or U S personnel who died in one of the bombings at the airport. It really went media silent after that because they realized at that point after there was blood spilled, it was very unpopular. And it even had the effect of at least you saw the polling at first spike up to like, we need to stay and we need to exact justice, but then very quickly and decisively turn course to what's the point of spilling more blood. Let's just get out of here. And I, I think that was really the nail in the coffin was the um, death of that many U S personnel, even though it was only again, not to downplay it only about a dozen, which isn't very comparable to some mm -hmm. of the losses we even had in a war like, say Vietnam or even the height of Iraq when like Fallujah and when it was really nasty during the counterinsurgency. But I suppose that just shows the American wherewithal and stomach for war at this point and what they're willing to tolerate for such an abstract, if any goal at all, that nobody wants to send more kids to die in Afghanistan for something that we can't even define, something that we've also something that we've been trying to do for twenty years. And again, there's really no way to put it then it was the biggest break in faith in American, the American Empire, at least in the contemporary American Empire, than anything that else that has ever happened, because while Vietnam was a blemish, especially internally, I think caused a very um, a very distinct psychological effect to the American people when it came to our foreign policy, in terms of imperial blows, I will say that the Afghanistan withdrawal is the biggest blow that the American Empire has ever taken. Yeah, I agree. And most of it is symbolic, but it's in, it's very much indicative of um, of, of the decline. And, and basically, it, it, it gives other countries, adversaries, uh, countries that are kind of, let's say, like Turkey. Uh, in many ways, Erdogan uh, was well aware of um, of America's decline uh, midway through the war in, in, in Syria. And you can see that there were desperate attempts, even by him working with the Americans, in order to trigger some kind of reaction uh, out of the Russians. And notice that the Russians never took the bait in uh, Ukraine. They knew what they could take. They knew what they couldn't. And there was no way, uh, you know, there was no way that uh, he was going to go any further. And this is why they have to uh come up with these ridiculous ideas that a, a, a an invasion is imminent because it's not um how about when the russian jet was was knocked down in, by the turks and then shortly thereafter the one, one of the russian diplomats shot and killed on air on air right and still uh you know putin didn't budge so in many ways erdogan understood i think uh, the the he, I think he understood who he had as an adversary, Putin, and uh, where American policy was actually going. And this is why, very shortly after, he began cooperating to some degree with the with the Russians, particularly in arms manufacturing. And he knew that, and I think both of them were well aware what that would cause uh, in, in terms of the way the world would perceive both Turkey and America after that was 
it was obvious. It was a betrayal, and yet America can't jettison Turkey, and Turkey knows this. Oh, and we tried to, the uh, 2016 coup attempt. Well, yes, of course, there's that, yes, uh, of, of course. Uh, but I'm saying a lot. some of these events happened after that. Um, oh yes, probably, I mean, but like probably it's a kind of revenge on the, on, uh, you know, on the on the Russians for warning him. Um, in in any case, you know, I I think um, um, yeah, he's not. No, nobody's going to fall for this. Uh, like I say, everyone sees the the patience. That patience has been the the, the strategy that's been most successful against the U.S. Which is very fitting for such a young and impulsive nation, I suppose. But the, the last thing I'll say about Afghanistan really here is I suppose it was a culmination of all of these things that we have discussed, all these things in the American Empire, not just of the Middle East, not just of Central Asia, but the American Empire in general. It all culminated within that withdrawal date from Afghanistan. And I don't really think there's any way, other way to put it which is why I think, despite the numbers of people we were, we were evacuating so low, despite the number of casualties being, you know, relatively low during the evacuation, much higher than you know an evacuation should be compared to, say, the Russian evacuation. Well, what you have with all of that put together is, it's really the story of the American Empire for the past twenty years, isn't it? And very fitting that it also came on the eve of the twentieth anniversary of nine eleven. Just all those things, just. Again, it was a, um, it was a focal point of all of that, and I think that's probably the most significant thing about it, beyond any um, thing you can say about how botched it was. Even if it would have been a clean withdrawal, I think that still would have done a, a number on the American Empire. It only exasperated how bad the American Empire looked because of how disastrous it went. But by no means mm. would a clean withdrawal would have saved our reputation. This. Yeah, that um, I I would say that the the nitty gritty of you know the the horrible pictures that we saw emanating from the withdrawal uh, were so disturbing um, that that too is a, is a, is a mark. Uh, how well it'll be remembered? I I mean I think I think it actually will be remembered. Uh, Quite, quite well in a, in, a, in a culture that forgets very, very quickly. Uh, you know, that image of people hanging on to the outside of a plane in, in order to get out of Afghanistan, knowing how, you know, the culture is so dependent on whether there's American presence there or not. When it's not there, it's that culture will revert back to what it was. Right. And the real war was you had 20 years to change that culture and it, it didn't happen and as soon as you were gone it reverted and i have a feeling that trend is going to continue for the foreseeable future it will be interesting to see as american influence inevitably declines in both europe and east asia you think particularly south korea and japan how embedded liberalism is in those countries because in the case of Japan in the case of um, Germany of course and even other places in Europe even if it wasn't a direct influence uh, I mean America directly wrote the constitution of two of those countries they were occupation constitutions but it will be interesting to see as, right. as American influence declines how much of this quote unquote woke ideology of this liberalism will be embedded in in these places that we left behind. Because you think, obviously, the Middle East, a uh, place in Africa, a place even in Latin America, it's much less ingrained. But you also have to remember, particularly in the case of Europe, particularly in the case of Western Europe, they were also the, the co-founders of these ideas centuries ago. I mean, one needs to look no further than the French Revolution, and you could go even you know further back than that if you wanted to. So... One could reasonably say, and I do maintain, that a lot of the liberalism that we see in Europe would decline, especially outside of the Anglosphere, but I do think because of their integrated history with both the Anglosphere and the um, French, that they're much more touched by liberalism. It would take, I'm not saying it's possible, I'm saying it would take a 
much stronger effort to uproot it than it would in many other places in the world. Right. Um, you know, and I, I, I personally think that if America were to fall, or let's just, let's just say it's obvious by 2030, let's just say in eight years, it's so it, it's more obvious than today than what 2021 has shown that America is no longer the the global empire that it that it once was and um, that in retrospect the last 10 12 years demonstrate that and it will be far worse in 10 years uh, you're not just going to see countries like you know Russia China Iran Turkey you know doing their own thing going their own way like the very concept of liberal ideology will will fall apart it will be the end of it America has to fall for that to happen. But if it does, it will be the way formal communism uh, was accepted and then was rejected, did, with the fall of the Soviet Union. The same thing will happen. Okay, I've I've actually Um, just came up with a really good barometer for all of this. The way we can determine this hmm. best is when will countries start repealing LGBTQ CIA laws? That will be the true sign of the end of American occupation. (laughs) Yes. Well, in a way, Putin already did that uh, prior to the the coup in Ukraine, right? That's why there was so much pressure pushed on oh, him no, during the, uh, admit, the Winter I'm, Olympics. I'm only half joking when I say that. Where, again, I do think in some oh, places, yeah, okay. like you, you know, uh, America's, let's just say, um, co-conspirators, which I would say, the the big two are are France and the UK. I think, I think they're much the same when it comes to having that ideology rooted, but even some places in Europe, I mean, for example, you you have to remember that Germany legalized gay marriage after America, and Germany is supposed to be the testing ground, supposed to be the, uh, the realm of experiment for the American Empire's social, uh, social movements, as, as Yeah, Germany and California. Yeah, uh, yeah, quite literally, uh, but, yeah, and even the, the testing ground itself got gay marriage after we did and they had to sneak that in an omnibus bill that came along with tech surveillance so that shows how popular it was even in a country as broken down and beaten as the germans so uh while one may think that these things are here to stay i think they're much more fragile fortunately than we do actually realize but that's Mm -hmm. all i had for 2021 how about you you have any last stories of the year (laughs) <laughs> no, only that I echo with you that uh, Afghanistan was the most important story. Uh, I don't know if normies will recognize that, but that was definitely the most important story. The most forgotten story is January the 6th, which they will rehabilitate all of 2022 because the primaries will be there. Don't for don't vote for a GOP member because <laughs> uh, uh, we'll they'll take us. They'll take our democracy away. Uh, you'll hear that line quite a bit. Yeah, and, and, and we're um, on the precipice of the anniversary, so you can expect all the uh, the, the mournful uh, commemorations about uh, whatever officer died from a heart attack and how democracy almost fell that day, but we still managed to triumph, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so yeah. You, can, you can look forward to that in about five, six days here, depending on when I decide to get this out, which you'll, you'll probably be watching this uh, New Year's afternoon, in which case, uh, once again, happy 2022, because... Uh, and let's hope, uh, you know, and I think there's some tepid reason for optimism. I know that's a shock from this show. It'll be a real shock when I get you to say that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, we plan to keep on chugging along as long as uh, as long as we're able to. So, so long as there are happenings, I suppose we will be here. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in, uh, not only to this episode, but all throughout this year and all throughout the lifespan of the show. We're almost on the... Uh, fourth anniversary of the show march 2022 will mark that so thank you everyone for tuning into this thank you and have a wonderful new year and goodbye take care